think, as you know, on Saturday, we passed the 100-day mark from when we had our first case of COVID-19 uh, in Pennsylvania. And back then, back in the early days of this, 100 days ago, my fellow governors and I were facing the monumental task all across the country, deciding the best way to halt a virus that we really knew nothing about. In Pennsylvania, we chose to act swiftly and decisively to eliminate as many public interactions as we could in anticipation of this virus's spread. The idea was to buy time, that we really wanted to make sure that our healthcare system was not overwhelmed. And because we took quick, decisive action, we never actually reached the sky-high new rates that many other states have reached. We never saw ventilator shortages. In fact, I think, I think today we have 5,300 or so ventilators mm -hmm. out uh, about in the Commonwealth, of which about 170 are being used for COVID-19 patients. So we never saw ventilator shortages, and our hospitals did not become overburdened. But just like in other states, Pennsylvanians, we've all, we're all eager to resume our lives. And I've heard this and I understand the calls for reopening. I know what it's like to be a business owner worried about survival. I know what it's like to feel cooped up in your home uh, and not being able to go to your favorite restaurant or your favorite store. I know what it's like to miss family. I know what it's like to miss friends. But we also, right here in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth, we're responsible for the lives of all Pennsylvanians. And so we've tried to balance these things uh, with measured science-based actions, including when it comes to reopening. Every week we've used data to walk a tightrope between risking lives and being too cautious. And because of the virus's incubation period, we couldn't know immediately uh, how we're doing. We he needed to make sure that we, we were doing this on a time frame that, that recognized uh, the, the virus's time, that the virus is dictating to all of us. Now we have the data and we know that our science-based approach has made Pennsylvania actually one of the leading states when it comes to addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. Our new case rate has fallen consistently, even as we've reopened businesses, even as we've resumed activities, even as we've gone back to work. Our new case rate is now about a quarter, a quarter of what it was at the peak. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that we are one of just three states, along with Hawaii and Montana, that has had a downward trajectory of COVID-19 cases for, for more than 42 days. According to Johns Hopkins University's Coronavirus Resource Center data, Pennsylvania's steady decline in cases since April is particularly important uh, because it's happened as we've opened more counties. The latest report indicates Pennsylvania is among a handful of states with sustained decline in cases over the past two weeks, and that's an important indicator that reopening plans are actually working. We know our decline is real because of the choices we've made, because more than half the states are experiencing just the reverse. I don't know what the count is today, 23 or so states are, 24 actually are having an increase in, in cases. We're not. Uh, so uh, we, we have had, a, I think, a, a good experience. We've remained focused on balancing economic interests with public health. And we've de done that by relying on science, be re by relying on, on evidence. So decisions like allowing businesses to bring employees back but requiring physical barriers and health screenings, that stuff works. Allowing stores and restaurants to reopen but requiring Pennsylvanians to wear masks, which re has been shown to reduce trans transmission of COVID-19. We're allowing sports, youth sports, to resume, but we're implementing protocols to cut down on touch points. We recognize that this is not an either-or situation. We shouldn't have to, and we don't have to choose between the health, our health and our economy. There's a middle ground that allows us to open businesses while cutting down on the spread of COVID-19. By participating in small actions recommended by the CDC and the Pennsylvania Department of Health, we can continue to break down transmission links even while we resume, resume daily activities. Actually, things like washing hands, that works. Bringing your own water to sports practice, that works. And of course, wearing masks, that works. Recently, more studies have been coming out that showing that mask wearing actually, actually works. This includes a peer-reviewed study published in scientific journals like the New England Journal of Medicine. I guess there are multiple studies. 
As the U.S. Surgeon General said just a few days ago, wearing a mask does not impinge on our freedom. It gives us more freedom from unknowingly spreading COVID-19 to others. It actually increases their freedom. As I've said, this opening, reopening process is about balancing small choices like wearing a mask with the greater ability to go places and do things that we really want to do during this pandemic. Pennsylvanians have done an excellent job. We all have done an excellent job demonstrating how to balance business and public health. If we keep this up, we can continue to be a model to other states, and we can continue to be a leader at saving lives and livelihoods during this pandemic. So thank you very much, and thank you to Pennsylvanians. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Governor. As the Governor has been saying, wearing a mask is a relatively easy but very effective way to help prevent the further spread of COVID-19. It is really essential and required that employees in businesses and in uh, stores, et cetera, wear masks and that the customers wear masks. And by having the whole community wearing masks, we protect the community from this spread of this very contagious respiratory virus. The governor had, had mentioned that there are new studies emphasizing the effectiveness of mask wearing uh, in terms of protecting communities. There's another important way, though, that people can help. We know that of the nearly 80,000 Pennsylvanians who have had COVID-19, approximately now 75% have recovered. I am encouraging Pennsylvanians who have had COVID-19 and fully recovered to donate plasma. Because you have recovered, your plasma now contains COVID-19 antibodies. These antibodies actually helped your immune system recover when you were sick with COVID-19. And those antibodies could help someone now who is battling the virus as we speak. If we see the potential anticipated resurgence of COVID-19 in the fall and winter, then your plasma may help many more people in their recovery. In addition, if you have not had the virus, COVID-19, then blood, platelet, and plasma donations are still urgently needed to treat people with other serious medical conditions. The American Red Cross is testing all blood of, do of donations for COVID-19 antibodies. You can call 1-800-RED-CROSS, or in other words, 1-800-733-2767, to find a blood drive near you. Please remember, if you have questions about your health, please contact your health care provider. If you need mental health resources because you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, please contact the crisis text line by texting PA to 741741 or call the statewide support and referral helpline at 1-855-284-2494. Again, 1-855-284-2494. If you or someone you care about needs help with a substance use disorder, please call the Department of Drug and Alcohol Program's Get Help Now hotline at 1-800-662-HELP. Again, 1-800-662-HELP. And what is most important for Pennsylvanians to remember is stay calm, stay alert, and stay safe. Thank you very much. And now the governor and I are pleased to answer questions. Questions? Yes. What's um, next with Spring Carlisle? I know that they're out there. There's a bunch of people out in Carlisle right now at the fairgrounds. Um, what's next with that event? Are there, are there plans to shut it down? The, you're talking about the car show? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're trying to keep people safe. So I think maybe you want to sure. talk about Thank that. Thank you, sir. So, you know, we, we are very concerned about mass gatherings. And so for events like this, we have a limit of 250 people um, in terms of a mass gathering. Um, unfortunately, at, at that event right now, I mean, sometimes 30,000 a day or 100,000 people might come from all over Pennsylvania and other places in the United States. That is, um, poses a significant threat 
to the public health in terms of, uh, of the contagiousness and transferring uh, COVID-19 and, and could itself lead to significant outbreaks throughout Pennsylvania and other places in the country. So uh, we have a petition for an injunction um, I, I, uh, in terms of, of closing that event, and that's in the courts right now. Um, yes? Can I ask a follow-up to that sure. question? Is that going to be one of the department's uh, main ways of responding to going forward? Is that going to be like a legal strategy? If others start doing it, we start seeing concerts or whatever the case may be that involves more than 250 people. Well, we have put out guidance, very clear guidance, that events like this, so whether it's a, a car show or something like a concert, has a limit of 250 people. So um, we anticipate that people will understand that that uh, guidance and that order uh, put out by myself and a separate order put out by the governor and will comply. I guess if they don't comply, we'll have to see what legal actions are necessary. Me, yes, sir. Add something to that. It, it's interesting, it, for the most part, these guidelines have been in, in concert with with uh, uh, organizations from professional sports teams uh, and leagues uh, to PIAA and and so so w w I, I haven't really come across many people say that you know I really don't want to keep my patrons safe or my employees safe uh, there's a real interest in trying to do this right we recognize that the enemy out there is this virus and and we need to work together uh, and bring all the insights we can to actually figure out what the right guidelines are to keep people safe. So I, I don't see that as a, as a really good strategy. What I see is the strategy we've been pursuing, which is working with organizations to actually keep people safe. Yes, Dennis. But if I could follow up on that, Republican lawmakers just released a letter about that issue saying there seems to be inconsistency in that this thing is outside. It's, their malls are currently allowed to be open and people are inside. This is outside that they can be done safely and that you yourself was at a march and there's been protests with several more people than that. And they see it as an inconsistency in what you're trying to stop and what you're not trying to stop. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there are, I think I've talked about why I was in that, that march. I thought that was important for me to take that risk. Uh, uh, and everybody has different reasons for doing different things. We're all trying to keep people safe. And, and again, the enemy out there is the virus. And you could take pick apart everything that I've done or that Secretary Levine has done and say, I'm not sure why that is. And granted, there, there might be some things that you could actually, or maybe we just disagree. But in the end, it's not about that. It's not, we can disagree all we want. What we're trying, all should be trying to do is figure out ways to keep that virus from infecting us. And that's, that's all we're trying to do, pure and simple. If I can ask a COVID question, are there any areas, now that you've reopened many areas, where you're seeing, that's giving you pause, where you're seeing a spike or an increase? I know you mentioned we're one of the only states where the trend has been down, yeah. but are there any areas that you've reopened that you're keeping an eye on that are concerning you? Very few. You want to you take sure. that? Because we were just talking about that a few minutes ago. Well, so, so we're watching really all areas of the state, and we get daily data reports, um, and that data uh, drives our decisions in terms of considerations of what counties can go uh, from yellow to green. Uh, so we will tomorrow come up with our, um, our recommendations, then we uh, pose our recommendations to the governor, and the governor will make his decision. Those will be announced on Friday, what counties might be able to go from yellow to green a week from now, which, a week from Friday, which would be the, the 26th. But we're keeping a close eye on all of the counties and all of the areas, um, and uh, that's the importance of our um, testing and the importance of our contact tracing. Uh, we have really quite a robust contact tracing network with um, uh, close to 500 contact tracers. Of course, our nurses, our public health nurses are leading that effort, but they're not the only people in that effort. Uh, we are working with Geisinger. We're working with Penn State and other health systems, and then we have a whole core of volunteers and others that we're hiring and contract, contacting, contracting with uh, to do contact tracing. Uh, and the idea is uh, then to, uh, to, to be able to contain that type of spread um, of COVID-19. So uh, we'll be releasing the detailed information about the specific counties on Friday. But I think to answer your question, um, the very few exceptions that w we're seeing, this this is a consistent decline all across the Commonwealth. Yes? Uh, Governor, what is your response to the Supreme Court deciding to take up the lawsuit to end the emergency declaration? Uh, I, I applaud that. Yeah. Uh, back to just the reopening of the counties. Uh, can you give the Erie County residents some kind of update on 
the kind of trajectory they might be on. I know there's a lot of questions going on. Yes, that right. announcement will come out Friday. Uh, the state Senate last week passed a proposed constitutional amendment that would limit future disaster declarations to 30 days, which could then only be extended uh, by the legislature. Yeah, amendment. it 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 affected the constitution. It actually was not a constitutional amendment. A constitutional amendment needs to be done in two separate sessions, and then it goes straight to the right, people. It'll, it'll it wasn't. Passage I don't. The it passed the Senate. It'll need to pass the House and then pass the yeah. legislature. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we're talking about two different things. In the, in the event that that would be passed and it would limit the ability for a governor to extend, you know, future declarations, right. do you have concerns that that could hamstring response efforts? Yeah, I think I think uh, democracies, like every other government, uh, require from time to time uh, its uh, elected representatives to deal with crises, whether it's a hurricane or a, a terrorist attack or a pandemic. Um, and so democracies at the federal level, at the state level, I think every state has declared a disaster declaration, uh, make use of, of this kind of emergency authority. They tightly constrain it, uh, and, and the General Assembly or the legislatures have the ability to, to uh, terminate it, terminate it uh, uh, in due course with, again, the uh, ability comes a law, but passage of both houses signed by the the, the governor or vetoed and then it, they can override it. I think there are all kinds of constitutional ways that, that uh, they can uh, uh, balance uh, an executive that is trying to do the right thing to make quick decisions and, and try to keep its citizens safe. Uh, whether you're a democracy or an autocracy, you, you, you have that power. And so this is what democratic uh, uh, nations and states have, have done, made use of that. Uh, you constrain that, and I think you constrain the ability of a democracy to survive. All right, back to Erie County, just one more time. The metrics, you know, lawmakers there have raised questions about, you know, they've said that they've met every single one except for that 10% metric over the 10%, you know, less than 10% over the next I don't, over the course actually, of course. Actually, I don't days. think they did say they met everyone. I think they're in press review. So, uh, I mean, so there are a number of different things we look at in terms of, of counties um, and the score, the um, dashboard, which is available on, on our website. So we want to make sure that there's contact tracing. Uh, we have worked with Commissioner Lyons, the health commissioner of Erie County, um, in terms of actressing, actually buttressing her ability to do contact tracing uh, with some extra personnel. We look at the, um, in terms of uh, whether there's hospital capacity, and there's certainly hospital capacity. We look at our testing, and we, we, we do actually, if she runs programs, we do all the testing uh, at our laboratory and we'll help her with in increased testing. Uh, what Deary County had had is, uh, is increases in terms of their numbers of cases, that it hadn't gone down and it had been increasing. Uh, there has been some recent plateaus, but again, we, we, we will be looking at the data tomorrow, so I don't want to predetermine what the data will say, and the data tomorrow will inform our recommendations to the governor for an announcement on Friday. So. I can't tell you what the data will show tomorrow. I know what it showed today, but I don't know what it's, and you can look on the website and see what it showed today. But uh, we're gonna look at it tomorrow and then we'll make our decisions. Sure. I guess their, their main argument is that they're kind of being punished for not having uh, a lot of cases in the beginning, whereas the 10% metrics, uh, you know, one of the representatives brought up Dauphin County, the fact that they had a lot of cases in the beginning, now because of that 10% metric, they're not, you know, they can have a few more cases um, but they're, they're allowed more of a, a window, I guess, than, than Erie County is for their number of increasing cases. It, that's really incorrect. We're, we're, we're looking over the last two weeks, right? So, I mean, if a county had a lot of cases in April, that really doesn't impact our decision whether a county is going to go from yellow to green in June. What we want to know is what has the county been doing since it went yellow? If since it's gone yellow, uh, and especially in the last two weeks, if the number of cases has been flat or going down, then they can go to green. And if the number of cases has been going up, then they can't. And so there's, it, it, and there are metrics associated with that. So that's what we're looking at. No one's been punished. We're not really trying to, none of this is personal. We're, this is just public health and the numbers. And we're trying, as the governor has said countless times, we're just trying to keep people safe. We want to make sure that as a county opens up more, that they don't have significant outbreaks that, that we have to then try to control. And that is to keep people from getting this very contagious and potentially deadly virus. So um, I, I can't tell you what the data will show tomorrow, but you'll know on Friday. Yes, for myself or the governor? Uh, for, for you, Dr. Okay. Kennedy. I was hoping if you could weigh in on uh, this question. I mean, do you think that we are ever going to get much lower than the current rate of 
new cases as long as the virus continues to circulate? And what does that mean for uh, the state going forward into the rest of the summer? And then I have a follow-up question sure. about complacency in, in light of everything that you've talked about today. Okay. Well, um, so we, we will always remain positive and optimistic and hopeful that our case counts will continue to go down. Uh, but this virus is not gone. And I think that you're correct. It is very important for people not to be complacent and not to have a false sense of security that the virus is somehow gone from Pennsylvania or gone from the United States. It is not. And most people remain susceptible. They do not have antibodies to this, uh, to, to this virus. And so we um, have to remain alert. As I say in the press conferences, we have to remain vigilant, and we will. And so the Pennsylvania Department of Health, um, uh, with um, our uh, partners with Pima, uh, of course, with the rest of the administration, we're going to, and our county municipal health department partners, we're going to be staying alert. We're going to expand testing. We're going to continue to expand contact tracing, and we're going to keep working to uh, to have a extremely robust containment uh, system present now, and even bigger uh, in preparation for any potential resurgence in the fall. But how, it, it certainly feels if you go out, if you if you even sort of observe anybody at a mall, at a restaurant, that there's very much a sense that you know this is we're, we're over this, right? This is not part of at least uh, you know the only thing anybody's talking about. What's the plan for messaging to avoid complacency, to mm -hmm. prevent it from occurring? Well, we're going to continue to message this on an ongoing basis. Um, uh, that's one of the purposes in terms of this press conference, in terms of highlighting the progress that we have made, but then messaging that, um, that measures like masks and social distancing and hand washing and hand sanitizer, that is the new normal. We are going to continue to wear masks. We are going to continue to need to liberally use hand sanitizer. We need to be alert and vigilant in terms of social distancing. Uh, for the time being, we need to continue to limit large large gatherings uh, of 250 people or more because this virus is not gone. And one, one other quick follow-up. Do you see any counties moving beyond green in the next few weeks and months? Well, and, and we are talking about that with the governor's office and, and with the governor, so I have no announcements about that today. But that the new normal is what we have to get to after we get through the red, green, and yellow. There is a new normal. Item. But is the new normal green, or is there something at, at, that's until what, there's a vaccine? That's what, that's what we're working on. Um, from me or for the governor? Um, either or. Um, well. In regard to a rising case count. Sure. Um, if an outbreak does happen, what threshold will be used to possibly um, go back to yellow, go back to red in areas of the state, like a city-by-city city approach, county, or region? Well, so um, uh, we're going to have a, 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 a dashboard that kind of shows how different counties are doing. Um, and so we're going to be putting that out, um, hopefully, um, some uh, initially, uh, maybe this week or, or certainly next week. And then we're going to continue to uh, to improve that type of, uh, of recovery dashboard. Um, but I think that we want to try to avoid uh, going backwards in terms of mitigation as much as possible. So we are going to concentrate uh, and continue to expand the containment efforts that we had that we have discussed. Yeah. Governor, would you like to? Yeah. Yes. Keep, keep in mind the the the, the way we addressed uh, and tried to fight this virus in the first three months was partially because uh, well it was dictated entirely by the by what we had going into that fight. We didn't have a lot of testing. We didn't have a lot of protective equipment. We were concerned that the healthcare systems were going to be overwhelmed. We don't have that now. So I, I would suspect, and that's what we're working on right now, but looking forward, we have a whole different way of looking. We're doing more in contact tracing. We didn't have the capability to do contact tracing, even if, if there were no community outbreaks before. So we're in a different place than we had. We, I, I assume that if we have a resurgence uh, that you know, of, of this virus in the fall, uh, that we're not going to have a vaccine at that point. But we are going to have a lot of things that we didn't have. Again, back in the early part of March, we were concerned about ventilators. As I said, we're using 170 of the 5,300 ventilators that are out there right now. We have stockpiles of millions of N95 masks right here in Pennsylvania, and it's not to mention the inventories that are out, out there. We're in a very different place than we were back in the beginning. And so the way that we're going to address whatever we face moving forward before we get a vaccine or a cure uh, is going to probably look very different. So I'm not sure that the green, yellow, red thing 
that makes uh, any sense. We're, we're working on what that new, new normal is going to be. And, and back to Angela's point, you know, com complacency is, is the, a problem because this is a struggle that 13 million Pennsylvanians, all of us, are on the front lines. Uh, and it's not going to be a matter of, of, a, of a policy. Yeah, I mean, we, we bought time, so, so policies were, were effective. But we've, each of us has got to internalize this struggle. We're in this fight, and masks actually do work. It's not a political statement. It, it actually works. And the virus is neither Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. It's out there to get us. Uh, and so complacency is, is the real enemy. Uh, and, and each of us has to figure that out for ourselves. And, and if we don't, that enemy is going to get us. Yeah. Uh, Governor, yesterday the Pro Football Hall of Fame um, in Canton, Ohio, came out with an announcement uh, about the game. It, it is set to be played in early August, but they've now um, come out with guidance that they don't expect to have that game played with fans in attendance. Along that line, and then with pro sports potentially returning here in the near future, do you also see a future of pro sports without fans in, in attendance? It depends on, on when, it, if, you, if you talk to uh, the NHL and MLB, they are talking about that. I, I'm not sure where the NBA is because it, they're still, their, their season starts farther out. The NFL is sort of in, in this uh, uncertain spot. And they've been talking about playing, of, of selling tickets but then saying, but if we decide that it's not safe, we're going to refund the, the, the thing. So basically play in front of, of no, no spectators. They plan, I think, my, the last time I talked with the commissioner, that they plan to do that on a on a game-by-game -game basis. Is there going to be a waiver? Because filling an NFL stadium is well beyond 250 in, in any right, green, right. yellow, red. Right, yeah, right. Exactly. Well, or that we go beyond green, yellow, red. And, and so that, that those things aren't aren't in place. The, those are the kinds of things that I think we just don't know. And again, the, the constant is we have a, vi a virus that's out there that's trying to get us. We have a focus on trying to keep people safe, and that has not changed, and that will not change. But what the, the, the tools we have, the resources we have, that will change. The knowledge we have, all those things will, will change. And as they do, uh, the, the, the things we bring into to battle with this virus will, will change. Is that a question? Yeah. Governor, today the Senate began, uh, Senate committee began two days hearings on uh, possible policing reforms in Pennsylvania. Right. Are there, what, what in that area do you support, and is there some things that you'd like to see them go even further than what they're talking about? Yes, I would like to see them to go further, but but what I think this is a good first step. I, as I said, and I think that what they're doing is in conjunction with the with the the House of Representatives, uh, and and what will come out of that, I, I expect I mean, we'll see, but but I expect will will be a really good first step. That we're still work to do, uh, and I'm I'm supportive of what they're doing, and I think we ought to do more. Okay, thank you very much.